Good morning, Jags. This is Fahad. Today is Thursday, January 14th. Let's get started. A quick high level uh, comment over here first. Um, I'm going to take the, the session a little bit lightly up until we know exactly what Biden is going to propose for his stimulus package, which is expected to be released today. It is estimated it's going to be about $2 trillion, but we do not know the makeup of that. So a lot of the things, uh, a lot of stocks and sectors in the market will move according to when that news comes out with the full breakdown and everything. We're gonna know sometime in the middle of the day, probably around lunchtime. Naturally, we'll keep you updated in the chat room. Now, with that said, only one stock on my watch list this morning, a stock that I covered in webinar um, back, on, back in October. So right here on October 15, we presented the bull case for BWX Technologies. And in this case, I highlighted that this defense contractor is the maker of uh, submarines uh, for the US Navy, including the, the nuclear engines and all that. Uh, this, this stock has been rather, under, has underperformed the overall market for quite some time, but this was forming a large wedge and I was looking for a technical breakout. And at that time, I mentioned that the best scenario here is to own the stock for long term rather than trying to trade around using call options. Subsequently, the stock rallied and we can see from here it broke out from the discussion it went straight up about 15 percent since that discussion before topping out. And in the past couple of weeks, this has been forming a bull flag. It cleared the major VOP resistance on rising volume, which is very positive. And then on light volume, it has been consolidating and holding above this VOP support level now. And so this morning now, there's an, another, another potential setup for a technical breakout. The reason for that is that Bank of America is raising price target in this stock this morning. This is a, just a one page qualitative note more than anything else, but they do point out something interesting. So they say, I quote, we continue to view BWXT as pure play beneficiary of bipartisan support for the Department of Defense um, Indo-Pacific strategy. The DOD's pivot to the Pacific has become increasingly relevant as recent global events have strained already tense US-China relations. We recently enacted fiscal year 2021 budget appropriated funds to procure the Virginia class program 60% above the president's request. Additionally, procurement, um, procure, procurement appropriations for CVN refueling overhaul came also 138% higher than president's request. These are very interesting items because I did not know that the procurement for the defense programs that run for the Indo-Pacific region, which benefits for submarines and various uh, naval vessels are actually running so substantially higher than I, what I previously thought when I presented the bull case in October in webinar. Um, according to Eric Labs, who is a PhD and a senior analyst for Naval Force and Weapons at the CBO, uh, he pointed out recently that approximately 28 to 38, 28 to 34 percent of total DoD budget is um, is now dedicated towards you know U.S. Navy. And if you break that down specifically, you will find out that majority of this is going to um, modernizing equipment and technology that has not been touched for a long, long time. So, for example. He points out that, in edit, uh, I quote, in addition to budgetary pressures for procurement and maintenance of the larger fleet, Eric Lebs highlighted the ambitious goal of adding 72 to 78 attack submarines, which is significantly higher than 66 attack submarines in the budget previously under Trump administration. Now, the important thing here is that there is this uh, stereotypical thought out there that if Biden comes to power, we're going to basically see the defense contractors take a hit because all the budgets will get cut. But that's not what I'm seeing in these writings. That's not what I'm seeing in these research notes at all. We're seeing the previously under Trump, the total amount of money allocated for the ambitious goal, I should say, for building out new submarines was 66 under Trump. And according to the senior analyst at the Naval Force himself, he's talking about potentially that's going up to 72 to 78 attack 
uh, submarines. On top of it, the budget allocation are running sharply, sharply higher. So based on all of this, Bank of America is raising the price target on BWXT to $80 per share, which is not even on my chart. It's way up here. The stock closed at 60 yesterday. So technically, this is a setup for a breakout. MAGD and RSI have also corrected. Let's see if this will do today. I have to tell you one more time that this is a rather slow mover. This is not exactly an easy way. It does not have a lot of momentum, so it's not an easy one to play using call options. The best thing to do is to just own the stocks, just as I presented in my, in my, um, in my webinar discussion back in October. That's it from me, Jay. Morning, everyone. Uh, so today, just taking a look at Motorsport Games, uh, ticker is MSGM. Uh, this company just came public yesterday, so there's not much to see on the chart. Oh. Um, but the information that I have is all taken from their S1 filing. Uh, the company was formed in 2018, and they then acquired 704 Games, which then allowed them the exclusive license um, to be the the official video game developer and publisher for the NASCAR franchise. Um, this license agreement uh, would span 10 years, so uh, that's set to expire in 2029, so a lot of time there. Uh, the company has also established other partnerships, other joint ventures, uh, such as with ACO, which is the organizer of the iconic 24 Hours of, Lo of Le Mans. Um, they plan to uh through this joint venture they are in the process of obtaining the rights to be the video game developer for the Le Mans race as well uh they hope to have a uh, resolution to this in Q1 um they also secured a licensing agreement with the BTCC or the British Touring Car Racing Series to once again develop mobile gaming console games etc um that license is going to expire in 2026 but now let's go back to the NASCAR franchise because this is what they're, you know, the majority of revenue comes from the NASCAR franchise. Um, you know, you can go on Amazon, GameStop, Best Buy, and through, you know, on Xbox, PlayStation, buy these NASCAR Heat games. Um, they are looking to expand onto the Nintendo Switch. Uh, they do also have uh, the NASCAR Heat mobile game, uh, which according to their S1, they have approximately 5 million total installs to date. Um, and then, so you have your Xbox, your PlayStation, 38% of the revenue right now comes from the retail channel, 62% comes from the direct digital download. Um, another interesting point or another interesting topic that uh, they talked about in their S1 filing was when they said, we believe we will be able to propel user engagement on Apex. Uh, this is our platform for the virtual racing community that we expect to launch in beta in Q1 of 2021. Uh, and then finally, they do have an esports segment as well. Uh, this doesn't contribute much to revenue yet, but management expects it to increase over time. Um, through the nine months ended September 30th, they have facilitated uh, 53 esport events, and that's up from 22 in all of 2019. And the total number of people that have watched these events uh, in the in the first nine months of 2020 was approximately 51 million, and that was up from a total of approximately 3.8 million throughout 2019. So a very niche company, no doubt about it, uh, but one that I'll be watching over the months to come. Yeah, interesting name. Only one day of price action here, technically speaking, which is yesterday's. If you look at the daily chart, you're not going to see anything basically pop up on your screen. This IPO was priced at $20 per share mm -hmm. and it opened yep. at 35 so very successful IPO. Yep. Um, and um, um, more importantly, I'm looking at just our highlights over here. I know you, you probably know far more about this because I haven't seen the S1 filing yet. But for the first nine months of uh, 2020, ending on September 30th, the company grew its revenues by 68% year over year. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I wonder how much of that was organic or just uh, um, or through acquisitions or through, um, you know, basically identified as direct beneficiaries of the COVID-led shutdowns and such that, that popped a sure. whole bunch of gamers last yeah. year. 
but an interesting company, very high growth, no question about it, only $595 million in market capitalization. Um, and, com- and, and more importantly, with the new game consoles coming out, could be some significant driver of growth there too for the next couple of quarters. So I'll be watching this one closely. Interesting yeah. one. All right, let's go to Chronicle. Good morning. So I've been searching for long ideas within the healthcare IT industry outside of telehealth, uh, because what I'm finding is that um, we're focusing too much on telehealth these days, but many are forgetting that about the growing demand for from healthcare providers uh, for integrated IT and data services. I think that's sort of going ignored while everyone keeps talking about um, the telehealth services like Teladoc. So I've narrowed down my short list to two companies here, which are Tabula Rasa, um, TRHC, and also MTBC, um, symbol MTBC. And uh, between these two, I'm going to go with the latter here, MTBC. And here's the bull case. Uh, First off, I should mention that um, this is sort of an anti-consensus trade. Um, Not to say that consensus is bearish, but it's more like the street doesn't seem to be fully buying into um, the company's acquisition strategy, whereas for, for myself, it's it's actually the core of my thesis here. So in case you're not familiar, um, MTBC, they're basically a highly diversified solutions provider to healthcare institutions, as shown by this diagram. And they're running a recurring sales model specializing in revenue uh, cycle management with software as a service contributing uh, a chunk to their healthcare IT segment, which is 80% of their revenue. Now, their offerings weren't always this comprehensive, and the quick version of the story is that they've managed to put all this together because of a series of high-profile acquisitions over the years, um, with Metagain back in 2016, and then Orion, which operates the popular Amadeus platform back in 2018. And then in 2019, they acquired eTransmedia, which added electronic health records and physician mobile solutions to their offerings. And most recently, they took over CareCloud um, in January last year, followed by Meridian Medical in June, and that got them into telehealth, specialized medical billing, and uh, multi-specialty health records, which which is essentially an oligopoly um, globally. Now, what's been holding the stock back in recent months is that basically consensus is worried that these two most recent acquisitions, CareCloud and Meridian Medical, for a total of $54 million. Um, The apparent concerns here are number one, they did these acquisitions partially through preferred stock and warrants. And uh, number two, the analyst community seems to be worried that the company is going to take a prolonged hit to margins as a result of these M&As. And this is where I disagree because when I look back at the company's track record at integrating their acquisitions, What I find is that they've consistently managed to restructure the new businesses in a way that significantly drops the operating costs. Like, for example, in last year's quarterly conference call, right after the CareCloud acquisition, management said that they immediately managed to synergize and slash operating expenses for that business by over 45 percent, including the replacing of offshore contractors. And then as for the Meridian acquisition, so they took over um, Meridian in June, and then in the Q3 earnings, management said that they already managed to reduce operating expenses there by 16%. And then if we were to look back at all their previous acquisitions before that, it's a similar story. Like this management has proven time and time again that they are fully capable of integrating their new acquisitions efficiently and cost-effectively. And if we look at this chart that I shared from um, H.C. Wainwright, so the one on the top, that chart uh, basically shows the company's margins over the last couple of years. Now, what we'll notice is that each time the company made an acquisition, the margins would decline for a bit, but then it always recovers within one or two quarters. So that's my point here. And if we combine this with the 49% CAGR for revenue since 2017, I think that's a recipe for future uh, future strong cash flows and possibly more complementing M&As down the road. So to sum up the bull case in one sentence, um, I would say this company has a solid balance sheet with very little debt and their revenues are growing. And importantly, I think the market is overblowing the concerns surrounding lower margins from acquisitions, 
primarily because I believe consensus is neglecting man, uh, management's proven track record and synergy. And so I'm personally looking to put on this trade right here, right now with a stop at $8.25. And I'm gonna be, gonna be targeting um, $13 over the next six months. Um, keep in mind, there's no options on this, so it may not be everyone's cup of tea. So uh, I just wanna highlight one, uh, two things over here. One, this company provides integrated suite of proprietary cloud-based electronic health record systems and practice management solution. Not to confuse this with Teladoc, Teladoc is more of a telehealth services provider. Am I wrong in this one? Or they are complementary in the same kind of business? Because one is actually connecting, Teladoc um, is connecting doctors with their with their patients, you know, telemedicine wise. And this thing is providing record keeping. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. Um they, they have a bit of um a bit of exposure to telehealth as well, but um that's the main um that's the main business here. Right. And so the if you're looking for a more peer-to-peer -peer comparison of MTBC, I think the stock actually really is this one, uh, R1RCM, which is the symbol RCM, which is which actually they name this company um, by the actual practice they follow, which is called Revenue Cycle Management, RCM. Now, for those who do not know, I about a year ago, a year and a half ago, perhaps, I have to look at, look back in my history myself, but in the Jaguar quarterly outlook, we presented a big bull case for RCM when this used to be a single digit stock. I believe it was trading at $9 per share at that time, and we recommended buying stock at that point. I know many clients are probably still on it. Um, you know, just two months ago, I was also getting emails and questions about this, and here we are. This is a stock, this is a small cap with a stealth rally for a long time. It's now trading at 25. That This would be the most complimentary one in terms of peer-to-peer -peer comparisons. Um, and as far as MTBC is concerned, the revenue growth of 50% year over year for the first nine months of 2020, that's quite impressive. The chart has settled back in. MEGD and RSI have flatlined. An interesting one. Let's see if this can spark uh, another rally similar to RCM and some others. The only thing I will point out that previously, if you look at the history of RCM, you will find out that the company has benefited from doing large partnerships from big uh, healthcare providers, both insurance companies and hospitals. And that has been the key reason for investors' excitement. We'll see if MTBC follow the same path and does some large deal signings to provide record rec uh, re to provide record um, keeping for patients, doctors, hospitals, and such. That would be the trigger for as a potential catalyst. But uh, other than that, fundamentally, great pitch over here because the uh, given the growth rate of 50% and the stock having settled back in. All right, folks, we're going to stop over here. Thank you very much for joining. We'll see you in the chat room shortly.